Welcome everybody. Welcome to our second hybrid Astro Cafe. While I'm talking, I will take off my mask. And uh, I'm so pleased that we get to do this. Uh, so we here in the, um, in the uh, Fairfield Youth Center all have our uh, Jet Puff cookies. You're gonna have to supply your own at home. That's the one advantage that uh, you don't have. Turn your sound off, please. Okay, right. It's on. It's on. Well, somebody's on. Okay, we're good. Uh, we have talks from our two science fair award winners. And we have some photos from Arizona that John and Gary are going to talk about. I am going to talk about the eclipse. Uh, We'll get David to do uh, some talks about International Astronomy Day. Uh, and we're going to start with that. Okay, David? Uh, sure, sure. Um, uh, Dwayne, you, you mentioned that there were some uh, high volumes coming from me. Is that better? Ah, okay, good. Still a little loud? Okay. Um, how about that? Is that better? Hopefully, I'll, I just won't, I won't speak very loud. Well, Anyways, that's perfect. Uh, that's perfect, David. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think things are definitely moving along with uh, Astronomy Day. I don't know how good the weather is. I don't know if Re Reg is here. Reg, can you do something about this terrible weather? I mean, <laughs> uh, any, anyways, um, I wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, there's going to be a check-in meeting uh, this Wednesday just for all the leads for Astronomy Day. So make sure that every, everything is good with you. Uh, if they're not, just let us know right away so we can possibly do something about it. Uh, the Wednesday meeting is really going to be about uh, understanding the setup and the, the breakdown procedures and just making sure that everybody has enough volunteers. So uh, that, that's on Wednesday. So uh, check your email and look, look for that. Um, one thing with the uh, getting started uh, SIG, uh, that's uh, normally tomorrow night. Uh, I did send out a cancellation, but... Uh, uh, it will be going on again because of the poor weather. Uh, originally, we were going to do some uh, filming up on the Plaskett or by the Plaskett uh, of us uh, kind of looking at the moon, but I don't think we're going to be doing much of that. Um, in lieu of that, uh, we will meet as we normally do, uh, but I want to sort of execute a, a plan. I said plan B, but I really mean plan C um, for the uh, broadcast on, on Saturday. Uh, we are broadcasting uh, through uh, RASC National on Saturday, and uh, I'll need some, probably some uh, sound clips at least of uh, people talking, maybe talking about the moon. But uh, Randy, I'm hoping there might be a clear spot sometime this week. Maybe I can interview you at a telescope uh, looking at the moon, possibly. Um, if there's not, we're just going to get some kind of moon content that we can fill 10 minutes with. Moon sets at about 10 tonight, so uh, we got a chance. I think it's going to be clear-ish. Yeah, I don't, maybe not tonight, I, but some night between now and Saturday. And I'll, I'll be prepared to, you know, maybe kind of interview you and get, get a clip of you uh, watching, the, watching the moon or something like that. I don't think the moon's up. It's new moon right now, I think. No, no, no. It, there, there's, a, um, it, there's a crescent. It's... Uh... I pretty thin crescent. The barrack, the moon is up. The, it's, uh... Okay, all right. Okay, maybe we can we can chat after this then. Okay. Anyways, uh, that that's it for me. Uh, if anybody has any questions about Astronomy Day, uh, make sure you let me know. Uh, otherwise, come to the check-in on Wednesday. Great, thanks. Well, thank you. Any questions? We're all good. Uh, I'm super looking forward to this. Uh, finally, we get a nice big. Astronomy Outreach Day, first time in a couple of years. So uh, come show your support and uh, be part of the, the, the fun. Uh, so about, is it three weeks ago? Four weeks ago, we had the Vancouver Island Regional Science Fair. And uh, David and Dorothy interviewed the students, the participants who did astronomy uh, projects and did a very diligent time talking to all of them. Uh, very good discussion about uh, 
how many, and there, there was some hope of offering more awards, but we ended up with uh, two, which was what uh, we decided. Each of the students uh, gets um, a certificate and the Explore the Universe book and a family membership. So it's a really good prize. Um, and they get to, prefer to present their presentation to the Astro Cafe. And I'm so glad that both our recipients uh, were able to make it tonight. So we're gonna start with uh, Bita. So can you- um, Hi, is it okay if I share my screen for my project? That's right, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. Okay, hold on, let me just. Okay, so um, my name is Beata or Bita, and I'm a grade seven student at Cedar Hill. And this is my project, Light at Night. So um, our community in Canada has like long nights during the fall and winter months. And during these times, bus stops can get pretty dark and unwelcoming. So when my younger sister learned about public transportation last year, um, she felt that people would feel more comfortable using buses if they were well, um, better or well lit during the nighttime. So um, I decided to create a bus stop light that used natural resources. It could be easily implemented. It did not have to depend on expensive infrastructure. And so I chose a solar heat collector to generate electricity using a thermal electric generator. And I used this electricity to charge an LED light. So here are the different materials that I use. So first it's a thermal electric generator. This is what it looks like. And basically a thermal electric generator is a small flat square device and it uses temperature difference to generate electricity. It works when cold is applied to one side and heat to the other. And the greater the difference, the more electricity is generated. So when heat is applied to one side of the thermal electric generator, the electrons move away from the hot side to the cold side. And this movement of electricity of electrons um, is what causes the electricity. And this gen, um, method of generating electricity is called the Seebeck effect. So here's some advantages and disadvantages of a thermal electric generator. So advantages are there's no moving parts. It's less likely to break. It doesn't make any noise. It's completely silent. Um, it does not emit any greenhouse gases. Um, it converts heat directly into electricity rather than having to go through any steps. Um, it's small, but it can be combined in series to generate more energy for larger projects. But some disadvantages are sometimes they're inefficient, they can have higher initial costs and sometimes lower expertise. Next, I used a solar vacuum tube. So a solar vacuum tube consists of two tubes of glass and one inside of the other and vacuum in between. And the outer tube allows energy to pass through to the inner tube and the inner tube absorbs it. And once energy gets in, the vacuum acts as an insulator and not letting energy out. Um, the inside tube can achieve temperatures of 80 to 100 degrees Celsius on a sunny day. And a solar vacuum tube typically comes equipped with a heat pipe to help transfer the heat out of the tube. So what a heat pipe, so a heat pipe can transfer heat very efficiently. It can conduct heat 90 times greater than a solid copper pipe of the same size. And this is why it's sometimes considered to be a thermal superconductor. It's a closed hollow structure that's lined with porous material called a wick. And it has liquid inside which transports the heat. So I also used sand. It's a cheap and abundant material and it can be used to store heat. It can be heated up to 1,000 degrees Celsius, and with proper insulation, it can remain heated for months with minimal loss. I also used a voltage regulator with a USB charger or outlet. So a voltage regulator is a device that accepts variable inputs of voltage or electricity, and then it generates a constant fixed voltage output. Um, it's usually used to decrease higher voltages, known as a step-down converter, but sometimes also used to increase voltages, known as a step-up converter. And I used a solar reflector. So the intensity of the solar energy at the Earth's surface is substantial on clear and sunny days, but when working in cloudy conditions, this energy is much less and needs to be concentrated. 
Reflectors can significantly, significantly concentrate the energy achieved by a solar collection system. So I used a V-shaped reflector, which has been found to maximize the heat gathering ability of a solar vacuum tube. So as the sun moves across the sky throughout the seasons, um, in order to get the most out of my solar collection system, I needed my solar vacuum tube to be able to change its angle throughout the seasons. And so to, um, to use this, I created a stand which allows my solar vacuum tube to pivot to the angle of the sun. And here's just a small model of it right here. And as you can see, it's able to turn and pivot. So it's able to get maximum sun exposure. So I also used an LED li um, light with a USB charger. So I needed a light that didn't require lots of voltage and which could connect to a USB charger. And I just found a USB rechargeable light on Amazon. It has 350 lumens of brightness. It's motion activated and can last for eight hours after it's fully charged. And the USB charger requires only five volts, so that's not too much. And the LED light is rated to be at least 60,000 hours, so it won't burn out quickly. Uh, I expect that this will provide sufficient light at night. And I think that since it's, mo it's a motion activated trigger, it'll help conserve battery. And lastly, I hope that it's long LED light will support its durability. And here it is right now, it's actually kind of lighting up, but this is what it is. So it's, you can see it's pretty bright. So here's my procedure. And on the right, this is like the full device. And on the top, that's where the thermal electric generators are. The tube is the um, solar vacuum tube. And that's, that's um, the bigger version of this, the race. And so here's the, my procedure. First, I placed the solar vacuum tube on a stand and tilted it towards the sun. I placed reflective material behind it to magnify its ability to capture heat. I created a small insulated box um, with thermal electric generators attached to it. I filled it with sand and placed it on the top of the solar vacuum tube's heat pipe. The thermal electric generators were connected in series to accumulate their electrical generation I connected them to a voltage regulator with a USB attachment. And last, I connected my light to the USB charging outlet and on the, volt and on the voltage regulator so that it could be charged whenever adequate heat was available. So for results, first I wanted to see if I could even get enough heat. So I found that on a partly cloudy day with an ambient temperature of 10 degrees Celsius, my heat pipe reached a temperature of 55 degrees Celsius within about 20 minutes. And on a cloudy day with an ambient temperature of eight, um, eight degrees Celsius, the heat pipe reached a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. And on a rainy day with an ambient temperature of nine degrees Celsius, the heat pipe reached a temperature of 36.7 degrees Celsius. So after I was able to get enough heat, I placed the box, the insulated box with sand inside on top of the heat pipe um, to see how much heat I could get and how much heat I could capture. So on a partly cloudy day with an ambient temperature of 11 to 12 degrees Celsius, the sand reached a temperature of 67.8 to 74 degrees Celsius. And after about four hours, starting at 4.30 PM, um, oh, after being left out in the sun for four hours. And the sand still maintained some of this heat. So when I came back when it was already dark, um, it was 37.1 degrees Celsius. And that was at 8.30 PM where it's already been cool for a while. And so after that, I wanted to see how many volts I could generate. So with a variable temperature difference of 20 to 50 degrees Celsius, my 10 thermoelectric generators were able to generate four to eight volts and about 0 0.6 amps of energy. I modified my design to fit 20 thermoelectric generators. And this was able to generate 12 to 15 volts and about 1.2 amps of energy. And when connected to a USB converter, this was sufficient to charge the battery for my light. So I faced lots of challenges and I've come with a few um, future steps. So some of my challenge was like finding a source of heat, um, getting and obtaining all the products I needed, using a thermal glue to connect the thermoelectric generators, um, soldering the wires or connecting them together in series, um, how I was able to place the sand, how I was able to get it into the box, um, what was the best way to transfer the heat and sometimes inconsistent voltage generation. 
So some future steps I think I could take was having a better container for heat transfer, a vapor chamber instead for a heat for heat transfer, a step up, step down voltage regulator, a more effective thermal paste or glue for better heat transfer, a two-sided vacuum tube with a horizontal corner. So in conclusion, I think my project turned out pretty well. I was able to use natural sources of heat and cold to generate electricity for the light. But with further, with further modifications, maybe more thermal generators, I think my device could be easily used to provide light in public spaces and help keep people feeling safe at night. So I learned a lot about electricity, and I also learned about, a lot about heat, how to capture, store, move, and use it to generate power. There were many unexpected obstacles along the way, and sometimes it was stressful, but now in the end, I also feel excited on what I could do. Um, I look forward to experimenting with my design, and I'm inspired to build more innovations in the future. So here are my acknowledgments, and here are my references. And I'd like to thank all of you for giving me the award. I really, I really felt encouraged to keep working on it after I was recognized for my work. It um, was really nice. So thank you so much. Wow. Nice work. And I just want to uh, show a little screen share. Do, 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 do. Let's do this. There we go. And that's uh, Vita with her uh, certificate that we gave her this weekend with her uh, apparatus beside her. So congratulations. That's really, Yay. really good. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy has a question. So yes. I thought, well, Dorothy, you may remember I enjoyed your presentation the first time and I very much the second time and admire what you've done. Yeah. I'd just like to remind you of the conversation we had right at the end. I was yeah. totally impressed by everything you did, but about the importance of the color of the light. Yeah. Since it's going to be at night, you want, and you could easily change to a, a light that does not have blue in it, and so it would disrupt the biological rhythms of critters that otherwise you'd have, a, in that way, you'd have an environmentally sensitive very environmentally sensitive light yeah. efficient and the light itself not doing any damage to the environment. So congratulations though on how far you've come so far. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Vita, I, I enjoyed your presentation at the science fair as well. And not only is it good science, I uh, I really appreciate the fact that you're an excellent presenter. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, do we have more questions? One more question. Okay. Okay. Peter? Peter? Nathan. Nathan's coming up next, Peter. Oh, okay. okay, Gary has a question for you, Bita. So Bita, uh, very impressive. What are you planning on doing in the future? Um, well, I haven't really come up with any future steps yet, but a nice, I would like think that maybe I could propose my idea to the city and maybe it could be just tried in a few bus stops that maybe could be used, but I haven't really thought of too much stuff I could do in the future yet. Good for you. So what do you want to do when you get, when you finish school, uh, what do you want to do then? Um, I'm not really sure yet. I, yeah, I'm not really sure. It's still lots of opportunity. I'm only in seventh grade. So thank you. We have still a few more years. Yeah, you do. You do. Congratulations. Very, very good. Thank you. After her PhD. <laughs> okay. That blew our socks off. Thank you very much. Nathan. Can you show Hello. Your presentation? So let me just add that Nathan was one of the seven participants who was selected to uh, represent Vancouver Island at the Canada-wide Science Fair, which is virtual, so he doesn't get to travel to Fredericton, which is where it was planned. But uh, keep up the good work. Maybe you'll get there next year. Yeah, I do get to do the judging schedule on Fredericton time, though. Four in the morning, our time. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> OK, can you give us your, uh, your presentation? Okay, so oops, um, this is basically the best pun I could think of for satellites 
shattering into little pieces and the effects of air resistance on them. Um, so yeah, my project was really looking at a issue that doesn't seem to be getting any better uh, with every single satellite that's ever been launched, which is the fact that debris is just staying up there uh, for decades, sometimes centuries, and we haven't really uh, been doing that much about it. Um, and while this isn't really meant to be a solution to reverse that, it is possibly a way to mitigate the amount of new stuff that gets stuck in orbit. Uh, so my project really focused on finding a better orbit for uh, the one of the most common types of satellites in orbit called CubeSats. Uh, roughly a quarter of all satellites in low Earth orbit are these little cube-shaped satellites, uh, small enough to hold in the palm of your hand, called CubeSats. Um, the problem with CubeSats, I mean, CubeSats are really great because uh, they're involved in like Earth and atmospheric science research. Um, but the problem with CubeSats is that their missions only last for a few months, but they get sent into these orbits where they stay there for decades. Um, and if you have satellites up there hundreds of times longer than they need to be, uh, they can cause uh, collisions. And in fact, CubeSats, CubeSats have been involved in several dozen collisions and uh, that can produce uh, a lot of debris. And the thing that my project really revolves around is that, I mean, if two satellites crash into each other, that's sad and all, but no one really, really cares if you lose satellites by collisions. The real problem is the debris that it produces because that debris can collide with other satellites producing more debris, which can collide with more satellites. And that is a chain reaction known as Kessler syndrome. That's, uh, that's not good, but it seems to be what we're slowly and inadvertently working towards. Uh, so the question that my project revolved around was, is there an ideal orbit for CubeSats? Um, you know, you can't really like test that experimentally without taking in a factor of a budget of several trillion dollars. So, uh, you know, I did this more mathematically, um, a mathematical calculation of what the best orbit for CubeSats would be. Uh, so the first step was to determine the average size and mass of CubeSats to determine the average collision force, because once you know the force of collision, it's possible to determine how many fragments the satellites are gonna turn into once they crash into each other. And once you know the number of fragments that form, you can determine how long it will take for one of those fragments to unluckily crash into another satellite. Um, and you want debris to be gone before that time because you don't want them, it to crash into another satellite. And so um, then I basically figured out how long it would take for a collision cascade to occur, you know, that Kessler syndrome thing. And however long that was, um, that let me determine the best orbit. Uh, so just going through this, finding the average cubes that mass and size was really just a matter of averaging. Uh, so yeah, averages. The average mass was found to be uh, 4,843 grams, and the average size uh, was, well, if it's cube-shaped, that's 12.15 centimeters wide. Um, and also, I should mention that this was one of the in, uh, inaccuracies of my study. Not that these averages are wrong, but just because there is such a wide spread of uh, sizes and masses for CubeSats that you know, saying that all the CubeSats are the same size is a lot like assuming that, uh, you, have you heard the spherical cows in a vacuum joke? Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a stretch, but anyway. Um, so the average- oh, well, you gotta tell us. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the average collision angle was also a matter of averaging. Uh, which further decreases the accuracy. Not that it's wrong, it's just um, unlikely that it's gonna be exactly on the average. Um, but the average collision angle was found to be 100 degrees. Uh, and with CubeSats orbiting the earth at around 7.6 kilometers a second, uh, then using trigonometry with a 100 degree collision angle, they're gonna smash into each other at 11.643 kilometers a second. 
That would give them 3.28 megajoules of kinetic energy, which for reference is like a car crash at Mach 1. Um, and both cars moving at Mach 1, so it's a relative collision speed of Mach 2. So it's not like a gentle collision or anything. Um, and this average collision force, the force of collision is uh, roughly 5.6 giga newtons. Now, if you see the prefix giga affixed to anything, that just means like it's big. Um, so it's a pretty a forceful situation. And uh, this is where it became a lot more, you know, theoretical. Theoretical physics of uh, CubeSat fragmentation. Um, now, if you've ever like dropped a plate, you might notice that it doesn't like form along um, like perfect contour lines or anything, even though that's exactly what I assumed happened in this project. Again, spherical cows in a vacuum, remember? Uh, so uh, I basically assumed for simplicity's sake that um, when these satellites smashed into each other, all these fracture lines formed uh, emanating from the center of collision and no fracture lines intersected. Now there was some reason behind this. Uh, it was to predict the least possible number of fragments that could form because it's difficult to predict the average number of fragments that will form, but it is possible to determine the very least number possible uh, of fragments that can form on collision. Um, this involves a, a bit more trigonometry and summation to determine uh, just mathematically the shape of each uh, fragment and what the average fragment would look like. I can skip over this just because it gets really, really, really long. Um, but it came down to this equation um, that the number of fragments was, or the width of the fragments, I actually solved for that. And the width of each fragment was determined to be around 769.79 micrometers, which means the CubeSat should shatter into a minimum of 92,655 pieces. Minimum, um, which means from here on in is basically a best case scenario. And uh, an interesting thing I uh, took into account in this project was that when two satellites collide and explode into debris, if uh, like previously calculated, they collided 100 degrees, the fragments ejected forward are going to be going way faster than the fragments ejected backward. That means some of these fragments are actually going to be ejected beyond escape velocity, and over half of them are going to be ejected below orbital velocity. Uh, so a lot of these fragments are just going to like leave, and they won't be a problem. Um, however, a large amount, 33,170 fragments, would remain in orbit and would still be a problem. So the standard CubeSat orbit is around 600 kilometers. Um, and you know when they get launched from other spacecraft, which is how they get deployed, there's some variations in the deployment speed. And that usually means, as a general rule, um, CubeSat orbits, when they're launched in a cluster, will be around 100 meters thick. So if all this debris scatters itself across this orbit, you'd expect a fragment density of one per 1,841 cubic kilometers. Yes, there's a lot of space in space, but um, with satellites always moving through it, eventually one is going to collide. For any one particular CubeSat, uh, you'd expect a collision in 520 years. Uh, that means that in 520 years, on average, all of your CubeSats are going to be destroyed, which is kind of sad. Um, but with 1,600 CubeSats in orbit, you could expect a collision after, on average, 117 days. Um, and that basically sets that time limit um, that all this debris has to be gone somehow in less than 117 days to uh, maximize the chance that you will not have another collision. Uh, so the best way to clear debris to get rid of it is air resistance. Hence the drag in breakup is a drag. Um, and basically the lower the orbit is, the higher the air resistance is. And you know, you don't want to put your CubeSats into an orbit that's too low because you know, then they're just gonna like fall out of the sky. Um, and you can't do any orbital science if you just can fall out of the sky. Um, but you don't want them too high either. Currently they're too high um, because they're gonna stay in orbit for way too long. So this was really the key calculation of my project. What is the best orbit? 
one where CubeSats aren't just going to fall out of the sky, but debris is going to fall out of the sky before it causes any other collisions. Um, and so here is a, uh, a graph that just plots the time spent in orbit uh, in years uh, versus the orbital altitude um, in kilometers. The green line represents CubeSats um, and the blue line represents fragments. Uh, you'll, you're probably noticing that fragments spend a lot less time in orbit than CubeSats do uh, because they're a lot smaller. Um, so they're, they slow down a lot faster due to air resistance. Uh, and this red line here is 117 days, which is that danger zone. Uh, if the fragments spend any longer than that in orbit, it's statistically likely there's going to be a collision. So anything above that is like, no go, don't go there. Um, however, you can't really uh, have an orbit where fragments spend exactly 117 days in orbit either, because this was a calculation that involved a lot of averages. And when you're dealing with averages, that's 50%, which means um, if fragments spend uh, 117 days in orbit, it's still 50% likely you're gonna have a collision. Now, I'm no rocket scientist, but 50% danger does not sound like enough safety to me. Uh, so I looked at some other orbital altitudes and um, calculated the collision probability for those two. Now for 360 kilometers, the fragment collision probability is down to 10%, which is good. Um, and then the other key thing is that CubeSats still almost three years in orbit. Remember, their missions generally last for several months to about around a year. Uh, so this is still fine for CubeSats. Um, any lower than that, and you might start uh, cutting off time for a CubeSat mission, as in CubeSats would not last long enough. So while it's kind of different um, and a bit difficult to pin down the exact best orbit, it is somewhere around 360 kilometers. And um, another interesting thing is that the European Space Agency's satellite regulations state that um, mission lengths, uh, especially for CubeSats, um, the mission lengths of satellites should be at least two thirds of the time they spend in orbit. Uh, in other words, they should fall out of orbit shortly after their mission ends. Uh, currently, with CubeSat missions lasting a few months, but they're them lasting decades in orbit, I don't think that rule quite applies to them, but it should. Um, and I did a bit of research on why we might not be sending CubeSats into these lower orbits currently. Um, that's because, you know, rocket science involves the rocket equation, and whenever you bring the rocket equation into the equation, sorry, um, <laughs> you end up with rockets that are like thousands of times bigger with a tiny bit more payload, you know, that stuff. Um, so fuel is expensive and a lot of it is required. And um, CubeSats kind of piggyback on other satellites. Um, so they kind of just get deployed wherever their carrier satellites are going. Um, currently the standard CubeSat orbit is 600 kilometers. And if we got this carrier satellite to travel down to this lower orbit and then deploy its CubeSats, that would add, um, that would almost triple its mass just from the fuel alone. And that would add four tons of fuel to the launch rocket. Um, like I said, fuel isn't cheap and the rocket equation really messes things up. But a solution that I came up with was, you know, instead of having the carrier satellites travel down to this lower orbit, you could just deploy CubeSats uh, at any altitude and then fly them down with their own tiny rocket to this, um, to this lower orbit. Um, so I used the rocket equation again to calculate how much fuel it would take to move a CubeSat from 600 kilometers down to 360 kilometers. It would actually only require a little over 200 grams of rocket fuel for a CubeSat. Uh, that's not a significant burden on the launch vehicle. Um, so while we don't currently have a solution for Kessler syndrome, this could be a very uh, real solution that is possible with technology we have right now in um, preventing unnecessary debris in orbit 
and could possibly give us time to come up with real solutions for reversing Kessler syndrome. Um, I would just like to point out some inaccuracies with this study. Um, yeah, spherical cows in a vacuum stuff. A lot of averaging and assumptions were made. Um, uh, the fragmentation pattern was probably the most extensive assumption. Um, however, I was at a bit of a loss for anything else since fragmentation is very random in real life. Um, in my calculations, the atmosphere was assumed to be stratified in layers, uh, when in reality, it's a very smooth transition. Uh, and then again, yes, a lot of averaging was done to reach conclusions. However, even if the results are approximately correct, it shows there are significant improvements we can make to where we are putting satellites. And if I were to summarize this project in just one point, it is that there is no need to be putting short-term satellites into long-term orbits. All right, thank you so much. Way to go. Do we have questions? I hoping to see somebody. I have a Here we go. Gary. Um, is there any possibility of uh, using, a, say, an electrostatic method of uh, deorbiting the satellites? Uh, for instance, uh, reeling out a, a conductive filament uh, as the uh, at the end of the satellite's lifespan that would increase its drag and uh, move it into the lower atmosphere. Uh, yeah, and any method that generates drag would work. Um, my project looked more on how to make sure debris isn't a problem in the event of a collision rather than um, taking down the CubeSats themselves. Um, but yeah, um, once the CubeSats missions are done, we really don't need them uh, in orbit anymore. So uh, even a solar sail would make for a, um, a method of bringing them down. Nathan, I have a question, Scary here. When you're putting a satellite up in a, a high orbit, you first of all put it into a really elliptical orbit, then burn when you get to the top of that elliptical orbit. With the CubeSats, by just firing it once, does that actually take it down far enough so you don't need to do another burn? Um, well, for deorbiting, you only need to do one burn because then air resistance can do the rest. But for moving it from a higher orbit to a lower orbit, you still have to do uh, the uh, two burns, one at the uh, periapsis. And then once you reach that, another burn to lower the apoapsis down to a circular orbit again. But for deorbiting, you only have to do one. Okay, thank you. Jeff. Hey, Nathan, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank Nathan, you. One, one of the issues, you know, as we get more and more debris is, of course, you know, the, the problems that debris causes. But I'm wondering if, if with the work you did, whether there is actually debris size that now no longer really causes quite the same threat of collision. I mean, your, your model assumes quite a bit of fragmentation. Um, is the assumption that each of those fragments still poses danger or despite staying up, I mean, is, are they of size that they could still cause uh, issues? Uh, yeah, so um, my project kind of looked at while, while fragments were still up there, uh, how much risk would they pose? Um, but I also included in that graph how long it would take for fragments to fall back down to earth. And by all means, fragments produced like decades ago are probably not still there just because air resistance has uh, caused them to deorbit. However, at higher altitudes, fragments do spend significantly more time in orbit. Uh, in fact, one pattern I noticed in the time spent in orbit was that every 20 kilometer increase in altitude doubled the time spent in orbit. Um, but yeah, fragments that were generated like decades ago probably aren't still there. I wonder, just, just to follow up, I wonder though, even with the new ones, if there's a specific fragment size that no longer causes risk, it's not so much the length of time, but, but just the, the, the size itself. I know a certain size is tracked, obviously, and, and there's smaller ones that aren't. But, but in, in the work you did, did you did you discern whether there's actually a size that no longer causes quite the same risk of 
uh, impact collision or damage with impact? Um, well, in additional research, I could probably, I, I would like to take that into account. However, uh, one of the inaccuracies and probably, and just simplifications of the study was to assume that uh, the CubeSats shattered into uniform fragments. They, so it was assumed that they were all the same size when in reality, of course, of course, it, they would shatter into different sized pieces. And many of the very smallest ones would probably not pose a threat to satellites. It just wasn't a variable that my project took into account. Super, thanks. Yeah, no problem. I'd also like to thank uh, everyone for the RASC award. I am, I'm honored and um, yeah, um, thank you guys so much for that. It's a pleasure watching you over the years, uh, Nathan. It's been really fun watching you, you develop in these things. Lori has a very good general question. Are you there to ask or do you want me to ask? I can do it. She says, uh, can you give us some of the jobs that CubeSats do in space? Uh, yeah, um, so some of them are for earth and atmospheric sciences. Um, some of them are actually designed to make measurements of the atmosphere at those altitudes. Um, some of them are for earth photography. Um, and by that, I mean like updating Google maps uh, and other uh, topography, geo um, geography. Um, some of them are just purely like recreational, like they put CubeSats in for uh, sometimes for the most ridiculous reasons. Um, <laughs> And then some of them also um, are equipped with lasers that can aid in uh, ground-based telescope calibration. Um, like I know some of the telescopes on Mount Kea rely on uh, lasers. Well, they have, they're equipped with their own lasers, but they also require a feedback or um, laser from objects in orbit to confirm their measurements. So um, CubeSats can be used for or telescope calibration too. Do the do Starlink um, satellite constellation was that fit the same parameters as the uh, CubeSat that you study? Um, so the difference between the Starlink constellations and the CubeSats is that uh, when you're putting satellites up for internet for everyone, you ideally don't want those to come crashing down back to Earth after two years. Um, so the Starlink seems to be a more permanent um, constellation. And so it doesn't seem like those would be short-term satellites. Um, and that's why this project wasn't really looking at a way to reverse uh, the debris we're putting into orbit, but just a way to mitigate stuff that we don't need in orbit after a certain point. How high are those? Um those uh, Starlink satellites? I do not have that information um, available currently, um, but I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's available somewhere. I see Joe's pulling out his phone. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you to both of our, our science fair awardees. Uh, you give us great faith in the future when we see such wonderful uh, enthusiasm and competence. And uh, we, we're really um, looking forward to seeing where you, you guys go with, with your work. Thank Thanks. you. And uh, Beata, now that you have a membership, I guess I got to hand over my longstanding title as the youngest member, but I'm happy to do so. Um, yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's great. I would now like to move over to some uh, astrophotography. So uh, this is going to be uh, John and Gary. Sister. Oh, John. Sorry. Is that the sister? Mm -hmm. Under generals, you can call it those dual monitors. Is that OK. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to take this off because it's... Yeah, take it off while you're talking. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. 
and there it is. Speaks with me weird. So what I'm going to show is data that uh, Gary Sedun got early this year in January, I believe, Gary. Yeah. And it's some of the best data that he got from the observatory down in Arizona. And it's, uh, it's truly amazing data. Uh, so I'm gonna show a, a number of pictures and Gary, if you want to step in at any point, just say whatever you want about these things, okay? Yeah, go for it. Oh, we have to spotlight okay, John. We're just going to hold, hold on. on. We have to spotlight us because it's not John that's speaking. Or is this computer? Well, yeah. So we have to choose or which one to spotlight. Pin, pin, we have to pin a specific one. Can you pin John? Yeah, well, we have to do it that We have to spotlight <laughs> us, I guess. <laughs> Okay, you tell me when you're ready. Go for it. We're happy. Go for it. Okay, can you hear me now? No problem hearing you. Go for it. Okay, so uh, Gary Sedun took the data. I did the processing, and I'm just going to show you some of the pictures. Uh, the first one is Caldwell 30, which is the large galaxy in the middle, and the Deer Link cluster consists of Caldwell 30 plus the small small uh, galaxies up above it. Uh, let me just go to the next one. This, this just shows the identification of some of those galaxies. You won't be able to read this, but that's okay. Uh, what's important is that those small orangish galaxies are about 10 times the distance away from us that the large one is, and the large one is about 50 uh, million light years away. So the, the small ones are about 500 million light years away, really quite a long distance. But you can even see some structure in those small ones, which is kind of neat. Uh, and Gary, just so that you know, you, you can look on the web. There's a, a fellow, uh, Gendler, yeah, Robert Gendler, yeah, yeah. He's probably one of the foremost astrophotographers in the world. Mm -hmm. And his picture of this galaxy has about the same resolution and structure that this picture has. All right, good, good deal. I had a look on the, on the web and it's uh, kind of neat. That is neat. A little comment so, about this. This is the uh, image that got me interested in astronomy. I went into the oh. Dean of Astronomy's office at UBC one time and across the back wall behind his desk was a picture of this galaxy and the little galaxies beyond it and I said my goodness me this is amazing look at the structure in the galaxy and look how far away those other galaxies are this is an image that actually gets your imagination going as to what's really out there mm -hmm. it's lovely that's true and of course for anybody that doesn't isn't aware of this, all of the stars there are stars in our own Milky Way that we're looking out through to get a view of the faraway galaxy. They're not stars around that galaxy, which although they look like that, that's not what they are. Ooh. Now, this is, this is an image of uh, M33, which is the Triangulum Galaxy. It's a very faint galaxy to look at just because it's very face on, even though the total light is considerable. And this particular one you can see from the, the uh, label at the bottom is uh, RGB and L, in other words, red, green, blue, and luminous together. The next one is uh, taken with narrow band data, uh, H alpha and O3 and S2. And it makes kind of an interesting picture. And you see a lot more bits and pieces of stuff outside the, the central region of the galaxy. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. <coughs> now this one, 
This is another one that has narrow band data, but this is a combination uh, of narrow band data and R, G, B, and L. So it's just a little different from the other one, but it still shows a lot of those other structures. Now, this is my favorite one of all of them. This is the H alpha by itself. And if you look <coughs> at this, you will see a number of interesting little structures. There are rings. Here's, uh, can you see my cursor in this? I think you can. So wow. there's this little ring. There's a, a double ring actually up here. Another ring over here, and rings over here. When I first saw these, I wondered if it might be some kind of artifact, uh, but it doesn't show up in any of the other images that Barry took. Mm -hmm. So I, I searched the web and I found, I actually found another person that had taken some H alpha data. He didn't have nearly as much data as this. This is, forget the total amount of time, but this is about seven hours worth of data, I think. And, but the other one, even though it's less data, it shows all of those same rings. Right. So they're real. Uh, if you look at the, if you look at the uh, structure that come, it, I can pull up from all of the different databases that uh, PixInsight accesses, it does not show those rings. So I don't know what they are. They're interesting. Well, I'm going to call them the Gary Sedan. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, aren't th those are primarily high star forming regions, correct? They or? are. Yeah, okay. For sure. So, what's really stunning is comparing the uh, our LRGB image to the hydrogen alpha image, and there's features that simply aren't visible. That's in correct. The, in the LRGB image that show up very, very well in the hydrogen alpha image. That's right. So the amount of star forming activity in this galaxy is just stunning and it's beautiful, quite frankly. The question I have though, is how do you actually combine this properly with a LR, an RGB image? Because there's an awful lot of hydrogen data kind of diffuse in the galaxy. That's right. And how do you do that properly? I don't know. I'm still fooling around. See, there's this there's, one, this was the best I could do to show the, this is in the narrow band plus RGB, and you can see the rings, yeah, that's but they're kind of dimmed by comparison. Yeah. Are they supernova ejecta? Shock waves? Shock waves. Shock waves, they, they could be, Randy. I don't know. I don't know what they are. It's shocking. But they're, they're beautiful, and, and this one, at the top here, it's actually a double ring. And that that's the kind of thing that you might expect from a, from a shock wave did or a set of shock waves coming uh, out. Did you do any calculations to estimate the diameters of any of those? I, I had a planetary know. nebula is typically only a couple thousand yeah. meters across, right? It might, be, it might be able to rule that out on that oh, no. alone. Oh, they're, they're probably not planetary. They're probably like... Uh, it's Ryan, hydrogen alpha stuff. Yeah. So it's it's hydrogen. So what do you what do you think, Dave? Well, it's more like uh, those are sort of I don't know how big they're in comparison, but they're like uh, the Orion. Like each one of those might be like a great Orion nebula. Yeah. 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 So they're possible. All, they're all star forming regions, then you think? Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting is that they're so far from the center of the galaxy also. That's that's different. Yeah. 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 Are they even part of the galaxy? Yeah. yeah, they line up with the RGB stuff. I so. think they are, but uh, without data to show that their distance, we don't have that. Yeah. It's hard to say, Joe, but I, if you go away from this region, I'd, I'd be surprised if you'd see very much more of it, but I don't know that. Okay. We, this we has to have been written about. This, the, yeah, for sure. this is called the trapezium galaxy. Yeah, and for yeah. I think we've got the makings of another uh, Astro Cafe talk. <laughs> so I think Nathan, Nathan can probably do his trigonometry and tell us how big, how big they are. So this is another galaxy that uh, has been one of my favorites. Um, for a long time, it's NGC 2903. And it's a galaxy that 
it's it's visual magnitude is nine. It's a, it's a real surprise to a lot of people that Messier did not include it in his list because it would have been quite visible to him. And it's it's one of the most beautiful objects that is not in Messier's list. It's kind of interesting, but it's a beautiful barred spiral galaxy. Some people have compared it to the Milky Way, which may look quite a bit like that if you're looking from the right angle mm -hmm. distance. It also has a bar. Mm -hmm. It probably looks a bit like that. Anyway, it's a gorgeous one. This is just with the, uh, the annotation that shows that there are other galaxies nearby. Uh, they're, pretty, they're pretty dim, but this one you can certainly see. Anyway, and then uh, he did one nebula also. This is called the Jellyfish Nebula. And this is the color version. But I actually like this much better because you can just see the structure so much better. This is, again, hydrogen alpha. And boy, does it look like a jellyfish in this one. It actually doesn't look quite as much like a jellyfish in this one. For one, for one thing, jellyfish tend to be whitish. <laughs> anyway. So Gary, any thoughts or comments about that? So, um, this is kind of the swan song of my scopes down in Arizona. After fooling around with them part-time for six years, I finally got them working last November. Um, and these are the three, four shots that I got before I had to take it apart to bring it up here. It's now sitting, they're now sitting in my garage, no, in my living room downstairs in pieces. <laughs> well, I hope you get it back together and yeah. take more. What yeah. good are they in the living like room in pieces? That's, that's what I'm thinking. Like, come on, the the thing that is so wonderful about this is that, I mean, he's got it operating in a way that is just getting such good data and with the 20 inch aperture you get resolution that you just can't possibly get with something smaller yeah. so we'll, we'll see what we get when we set them up here yeah, yeah. It's, it's wonderful kind of, they're shaped for that thing it's also like a shock wave yeah, uh, it, it is and it's actually this is a supernova re remnant ah. yeah Th thanks for mentioning that this actually is the remnant of a supernova remnant, a supernova that went off. You don't know the, how long ago, but it could be like anywhere from 10 to 30,000 yeah. years. Quite a long time. We had a quick question. Could you very briefly explain how you incorporate the, the luminance into the... Uh... Yes. What, how does that affect the imaging if you need it? That's really quick. So when you use a when you use a monochrome camera, what Gary is using, it's very common to take red, green, and blue, which gives you a color picture, but then to take extra data with a luminance filter, which is just a clear filter. And the reason that that's useful is that it, it covers all wavelengths. So it's, it's kind of democratic about what you do with it. And you put far more of your processing energy into making that luminance have as low noise and as sharp structure as possible. And then basically the, the software will overlay the, the luminance on top of the red, green, blue image. And that luminance uh, overlay determines how bright the image is. The color de below determines the colors. But yeah. answer your question. That makes sense. Yeah, so is that some of your resolution, your sharpness? The sharpness is, you work on the sharpness most with the luminance. Yeah. yeah. And some people will use, uh, and I tried it for some of these. Sometimes you can use a hydrogen alpha filter as a luminance filter too, but it's not democratic. It's it's favoring. Um, I tried that on the M13 Gary, to see if 
and figure out how that would do it. It wasn't, mm -hmm. I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't too good. I can show it to you later yeah, if you want, but it, yeah, I didn't I'm, like I'm it. still fooling around with this myself, and I'm having quite a few problems properly integrating the hydrogen alpha into the arch, into the other image. And oh. John's done an amazing job here, like good, good going here. I just love that we've got this thing going on in the club where people are working <laughs> yeah. together with the same yeah. data type. Yeah, anybody can have the data if they want. I just, I just... You know, uh, Randy, that's an interesting comment because when I first got involved with this group, I was learning things from Joe, from um, David Lee, from Bruno, and so on. And one of the things we talked about at the time was that if we if we shared our images and talked about them, we would learn how to be much better at this yeah, as sure. time went on. For sure. And Charles Banville, who's now in Montreal, but he, he was probably the, of all of us, he was the one that produced the best images early on. I think, Joe, that's fair, isn't it? I agree. Yeah, he, he was very good. He still is a very good photographer. Hey. He learned most of what he and, uh, used for processing from the group. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think it's true that we, we, we all kind of got better faster because mm -hmm. of the sharing that went on. Right. And Astro Cafe played a huge role in that in the early, in the early yeah. days. Yeah, and with David coming along with his, uh, what is that, not your HST, what, what transform do you have there? What uh, stretch thing do you have, David? Oh, the, the, the GHS transform. Oh, and I should have mentioned that, David. Uh, I use that for every one of these images. Oh, did you? So thank you very much. And yeah. featured oh. in the recent Sky News. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I've been yeah. using it since, his first, since he first showed it to us. Some, yeah. So we've got I a, guess bunch, it was last fall. a bunch of really good imagers now in the club. It would be nice to kind of share the data and whatever and do that kind of thing. Can I ask you something about this this photo? Oh, just go back for a sec to the jellyfish. Oh. So if you're shooting H alpha, wouldn't H alpha show up in the deep red of the spectrum? I, I mean, this is a great shot, but it doesn't seem to show any red at all. Uh, good, good question. Absolutely, it's red, but we're the camera is is uh, just takes black and white images through the different filters. And then the color is actually produced artificially in the processing afterwards. I chose not to make this red because I, to my eye, well, I like black and white images of all kinds. I like black and white portraits too. Yeah. So I'm, but this, this, if it were proper color it would be, Red, red, like a neon sign. Just, Thanks. just like a, something red on a black and white TV, right? It's just, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's monochrome. The wonderful thing about these images, John, on the black and white is that they really look, of course, much more detail, but what one sees. Yeah. And uh, I've learned a lot just in your going back and forth between the images to realize how our eye is just taking in whatever we can, but then using a hydrogen alpha filter, which we often use, can see so much detail. And as you said, depth, which I've certainly seen more of sometimes looking through the eyepiece with the filter than in any photograph. So it's, it's pretty neat, interesting discussion. Thanks. OK. You had a question. Just, just to, oh, answer, good, Dave. Just to answer this question, the luminance is really the integrated light value across all the frequencies. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's yeah. not it's not segregated, whereas the individual ones are segregated. Yeah. And then when you're producing this image, you can you can produce any of those in a black and white image. Absolutely. Uh, but what you want to do is is use the luminance data, the integrated data, to give structure to the other frequencies. Correct. Okay, so. Uh, that's what I wanted to show. Thank you so much, John. Well done, Gary. It's great. Okay. Um, I'm going to take the screen now.
and I'm going to talk about the um, eclipse. Do we see it on the screen? Excellent. And yeah, we're going to uh, put the, um, what do you call it? The spotlight on us here. Is your camera on? Oh. Because we could use you then. I could just don't turn your don't turn your sound on. We'll just spotlight. Yeah. You. Okay. So I'm on. I'm on. And find you. there we go. And you're gonna spotlight me. Ah, very good. And I'll talk at this camera. <coughs> um. So on, I uh, on May fifteenth, uh, I. The moon is going to rise in eclipse, and uh, the last two eclipses were wipe, wipes out, wiped out. Anyway, they we, we could not we were clouded out. It was very frustrating last May because um, it was beautiful. The moon was fantastic at midnight, but come four o'clock, then it was uh, it was all clouded, and I was extremely frustrated because I had already got excited about the idea of doing this great citizen science uh, project called Eclipse Crater Timing. Anyway, I really hope that we're going to see a beautiful clear sky on Sunday the 15th, and many, many people will join me in doing some eclipse timing. So uh, just so that we're all on the same uh, page, a lunar eclipse is where the Earth shadow covers over the um, covers over the moon and puts it in 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 the dark. And I particularly sorry, I'm having trouble with not having my screen. There we go. That's better. Um, so as the moon moves into the Earth's shadow, at first, if you were sitting on the moon, what you would see is um, a bite taken out of the sun, just like a partial solar eclipse that, that we see. But then once you passed this line, then uh, depending where you are on the moon, you would be uh, in, in darkness. And so the question is, at what time does that, do you go from penumbra into the umbra? And uh, so this is Joe's pictures from the last really good eclipse that we had that was uh, in 2019. Mm -hmm. And you go from the uh, just the full moon to a point that you're in the um, this transition between what's called first and second contact. And I uh, part of the moon is lit, part of the moon isn't lit. And what's happening right along that line. And so um, it's very topical these days because uh, in the search for exoplanets and trying to figure out what their atmospheres are, there's the idea of doing spectroscopy of the eclipsed uh, planet and especially that limb that has the atmosphere. And uh, we have a beautiful proxy here because as the sunlight goes through the Earth's atmosphere, reflects off the moon, we can measure it here on Earth or from the, the Hubble, and they, they're trying to do this sort of thing. So we're particularly interested in what's happening right at that limb. But there's an ancient, not ancient, but there's a centuries old interest in this as a clock, because everybody on Earth will be seeing that um, when, when, when a particular crater goes into the umbra when it comes out, everybody on Earth sees that at the same time. And so if you can predict those times, then you can set your clock and you can know your longitude. So this is something that, that they've been working on for hundreds of years. And um, what, what, um, the first recorded mention that there was a problem was the ear, L-E-H-I-R-E, -E, was a French uh, astronomer who um, recognized that the shadow is about 2% too big. 
And this was in 1701, something like that. So we're talking about a 300 year old problem and they still haven't figured it out, which I just love. Okay, so in this fantastic paper by Harold and Sinnott, looking at, uh, you know, 170 years of uh, observations, uh, they've compiled 22,000 crater timings. And uh, so just take a look at this. So, so here, the, um, you see the rays of Tycho, just as it's going into the umbra, and then here it's coming out of the umbra. And the observation, and this has been seen thousands of times over centuries, is that the Earth's shadow is too big. So why? That's, that's the question. Well, I'm not going to go into the math, but you know it's well defined. And the thing is, this our Earth is just too big. And I will we'll, we'll actually take a look at what the values are. But um, there's two general ways that you talk about it. You talk about it either as a percentage, or you talk about it as a um, you know, what is the notional eclipse forming layer? How thick is that extra radius of the, of the earth? And so if we just take a look, this is from one, the, you know, I, you can download their, their Excel spreadsheet. So I took it in and these are just a couple of the uh, craters from, uh, what is it, from 1989. Um, so there's about 20 observations of Grimaldi and about 20 observations of the timing that Aristarchus went into eclipse. Look at that, these are in seconds. So it's like two minutes range. That seems like a, quite a lot, but what they recommend is that you, you estimate to a 10th of a minute to um, six seconds. I think that uh, it's a bit optimistic to say that uh, just by naked eye, well, you know, um, telescope eye, you can say accurately to six seconds. But one of the things I'm really keen on is to just assess qualitatively what sort of uh, uncertainty we're talking about um, just from one person. But if you take a look at these 20 amateur observers, they've got plus or minus a minute. When you convert that using a uh, some programming that I, I've been asking all over to, to find somebody. And I have a uh, young astronomer friend who's actually online here, uh, Kelly Selmas, to see if she can help me. But um, we still have not found uh, how to do these calculations. So all I can do is report the calculations that Harold and Sinnott report in the spreadsheet. And you can see that the notional eclipse forming layer height they, when they average everything, they get 84 kilometers, but we see anywhere from about 10 to 140 with these two craters. So um, yeah, so the umbra starts early and ends late. And it's all about trying to figure out why. But the first thing is how robust are these measurements? And uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through this, but these are all their measurements from the, their various, uh, oh no, this is, yeah, this is just from that same uh, eclipse. These are all the measurements from August 17, 1989. And you can see that there are some craters that you see more and, uh, but there's this kind of 84 kilometer um, uh, line. They have all sorts of hypotheses that they're looking at about how it changes during an eclipse and uh, whether volcanism or, or uh, the solar 11 year cycle forms part of the problem. There, there's lots of hypotheses, but nothing is satisfying. Um, yeah, and here you can see that it's either in terms of a percentage enlargement or it's the absolute enlargement. And they say absolute enlargement is more constant. Um, so, so they, they think that this is the right model. Problem is 84 kilometers. What is it? Well, it's not clouds. 
Even cirrus clouds only go up about 12 kilometers. And, uh, you know, sure, there's some stuff going up there at 80, you know, noctilucent clouds, everybody's favorite in this club. Uh, but it's basically just a vacuum up there with a bit of stuff. And to think that that is an opaque layer is really a problem. So I, um, this is an unpublished paper. Paul Marmot was a professor, now deceased, uh, from the University of Ottawa. But um, his summer lab student in, oh heavens, 19, I think it was something like uh, 2000. Anyway, this was a, uh, Christine Couture was just a uh, lab assistant and now she is an administrator and a pianist. She's an administrator at University of Ottawa and um, but she, she didn't stay in, in physics, but she's the one who actually did these experiments where they, in the lab, had a picture of the moon and they projected a shadow across them. They got lots of uh, people to come and, and uh, look at it. And their conclusion, which is not supported by anybody else, is that it's an optical illusion. But I think they might actually be on it. The eye is an amazing uh, logarithmic uh, tool for, for making these observations. Um, and I, I think there, there's something funny going on in when the eye says that these, these uh, this occultation, this uh, umbra comes in. Anyway, um, I, I had a nice little email back and forth with this uh, Christine Couture. So this is what you get if you take a look at the, uh, from Sky and Telescope, all you get is um, a table of the times that it's expected that these, uh, these craters would come. I'd love to be able to calculate this, but um, I put this into a Corel draw uh, picture and um, I will share this around hoping that, that people will, will join me. Um, I've convinced Nathan to come to my porch. It should be very nice. It will be to the southeast and it's between 10 and 11 at night is when you're going to go uh, from totality to the umber passing through. So there's a one hour, not very late. It'll be about 10 to 15 degrees above the horizon. And Reg is going to promise me that he'd arrange a perfectly clear sky. And I, I would love this community to just take some pictures. You don't need, not pictures, uh, you can do it photographically, but that's a whole different thing. The thing that people have been doing for hundreds of years though, is doing it just with their, their eyeball and a telescope. I guess I wouldn't recommend trying all of these. Certainly Tycho is very easy to see. Uh, Aristarchus, Copernicus. Uh, I love Proclus. Proclus is this one by the uh, Myricrisium and it has this beautiful asymmetrical ejecta. It's one of my favorite craters. Uh, whoopsie, what did I do? There we go. Anyway, that's my story. And I would love some questions, but I, I can see that Joe is all worried because we have to be out of here in 12 minutes. I have a question. So, 10 minutes of questions, Max. <laughs> so the question, you, you mentioned photographs. Well, if, if you were to set up a video camera and just video the whole thing. Yeah. Um, surely that's been done. Surely it's been done. And, and what uh, does it show? It, OK. So a thing that I have done, um, with just the normal terminator, but I would love to do this with an eclipse, is um, change the contrast so much that it's, I just have zeros and ones. I just said black and white. And depending on where I put that threshold, I can move the terminator, oh, um, hundreds of kilometers. Uh, no doubt. <coughs> and so, so I would. So I guess the, the trick to do is actually do that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it that way. I would, okay. Yeah, no. What I would do is I would look at the curve of the intensity change, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure what the right estimator would be, but I mean a crude one would be halfway up. 
you know, and but there might be better ways of doing it. But you're absolutely right. If you if you take photographs and vary the intensity, you'll be able to move it that much. I'm quite sure. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I'm open to all things, all hypotheses. The, the, the argument that Harold and Sinnott offer for doing it with eyeball and telescope is that gives you continuity over the centuries. But that's not good. We, what we really want is to figure out what is the mechanism that is making the shadow too big. Exactly. And I think and, you're, and so, you're more likely to find that out with, with photographs. And there's another thing which there are a few articles now which choose some little piece of the moon and do spectroscopy. This is to look at that, that idea of the exo um, planet. But I've seen about three articles so far where um, they're using major academic telescopes and doing spectroscopy on one little thing to see what the um, Earth's atmosphere is doing mm -hmm. right at that level. That, would all, that also has timing information. What I haven't seen is overlap between the eyeball measurements and these, these uh, research grade measurements. And, and that's, that's yeah, it's something to do. <laughs> I have a different comment. Um, yeah. Because we're talking really about two things. Is this a real measurement? Uh, and the dispute is how can we ascertain if the measurement is real or not? But the other thing is, is there possibly a possible mechanism? Um, although the atmosphere is thin, uh, they're going through a heck of a lot of it. So refractive effects may well be important. Okay, refraction makes the oh. Earth's shadow smaller. That's, that's really important. The fact that we see a red moon is because the longer wavelengths are actually refracting. Sorry. So the spectroscopy is a really interesting aspect of this. And there's some talk about how you see a little bit of blue right at the umbra edge. And that is the light separating between the, the, the short wave and the long wave right along there. But in general, refraction makes the Earth's shadow smaller, but the observation is that the Earth's shadow is larger. So it's not going to be refraction. It could be opacity. I mean, it is opacity. If it is the Earth's atmosphere, it's either clouds or it is just all the nitrogen, <laughs> oxygen that, that's that's up there. I haven't even thought about the numbers, but what, how much does diffraction do? Diffraction, so, so the... the diffraction at the edge. At the edge. So, <laughs> bigger is the question. I don't know that. Because if, if, it, if it's large enough, that could do it. Good question. Because it spreads out both ways. And it spreads up both ways. And, and okay. The timing state in your back, if it's spherical, it's not, not, not flat. Yes, that's that's one of the things. They, the way they do it is they put it all in diffusion coordinates, and there's a lot of crank turning there. But there's another thing: is the Earth is not a sphere; it's an ellipsoid. But between the pole and the equator is only 23 kilometers. It's nothing near the 84 kilometers. Mm -hmm. But they try to put that in the calculation too, is you can actually get the shape of the Earth from, yeah. from the shape of the ellipsoid. Hi, folks. Can I uh, cut in? Um, I didn't realize we had this 9 o'clock drop dead date, but I have a big uh, JWST thing I wanted to show. OK, I'm stopping. Go, go ahead. OK. So it's been quiet, uh, but uh, just a minute here, just a second. Uh, okay, what do I have to do? Where's the, there's a share screen. There's a share screen. Okay. And do you see it now? Yes. 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 Okay, so this is what yes. we had a month ago. The uh, this e e evaluation image here was just uh, just uh, incredible, um, and uh, uh, with the uh, galaxies in the background. But we've just had a couple of things, uh, uh, and this is the uh, the layout of the instruments. But this was just put out um, uh, over the weekend, and uh, so. 
they have now got all the instruments focused. So these are all focused images from all the uh, instruments on board web. So one more step in this dance of the nine veils, which is now the instruments are being commissioned. And they aren't saying, I, I don't have a lot of information about what that means, but I guess they got to make sure everything is, is all set and ready to go. But basically everything is all focused now. And, um, and so uh, soon we will have uh, our, our scientific images from web. And uh, so this, uh, this is uh, this is pretty promising. So uh, uh, these might be the last things we see before they actually come out with uh, some real scientific images. But who knows? It's been a little different than what I've been expecting. So I thought I thought you might want to have that uh, sh shared before uh, uh, before we uh, close up shop. And I heard that that's the uh, Large Magellanic Cloud they're they're imaging. That's right. Yeah. Is is this data available on the web? Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. This is you just 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 go to the. This is on the. Uh, th this slide I just got from the uh, NASA web blog. So. Uh, uh, you know, and it's been all over social media too, and all that too. So. Uh, anyway. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. So I, that's it for this Astro Cafe. This is the second. Next week is the ninth. The week after that is our special general meeting. We'll start off the meeting. We need 25 people for quorum so that we can uh, work on the, um, the uh, what do you call it, bylaw resolution. Uh, which, which uh, is in an email. If you don't know what I'm talking about, contact me. Uh, but it's very important that we have our quorum at the beginning of the 16th. The following week is long weekend. And then the 30th will be our last um, Astro Cafe for uh, this season. And uh, then we are all encouraged to spend lots and lots of time up on the hill. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> that was absolutely excellent. The red chairs on the top.